So for example, um, a Pokemon, right, in Pokemon Go, or, uh, you know, in the Yelp AR app, you see kind of like restaurant recommendations around you and so forth. And there's some environmental awareness. Sometimes you have some limited meshing, um, or, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you can enable AR, you can use the IMU and the gyroscope to sort of know your directions and back based on that sort of like make some clever deductions. But by and large, we're talking about a flat and typically fairly dumb data overlay that it, that overlays your reality. As opposed to both of these, what we do, we call spatial computing. And the idea is that the Magic Leap One is a computer that is focused around you and your environment. So um, with very powerful um, depth cameras and, and solving algorithms, the, the device is fully aware of your immediate environment. It's a 3D geometry, 3D geometric representation of your immediate space. Uh, and we'll talk about the various ways you can consume this data. Uh, it's also aware of what you are doing and who you are, you know. So uh, the Magic Leap One has hand tracking capabilities, which give you access to hand gestures uh, like C and L and index finger, as well as a uh, finger key point. To, so you actually know where your index finger is and you can use that and you can actually use your hands to interact with mixed reality elements uh, in real time, which is extremely powerful. Um, the Magic Leap One also has eye tracking. So separately from head pose, which you might be familiar with, you know, sort of like raycasting from the general direction of the headset, you also get um, raw access to what your eyes are doing and where your eyes are looking in the room. So the idea with spatial computing is that we don't want adapt to a computer. We want the computer to adapt to the human. Uh, and the entire experience is uh, focused on, on you as a person, on your environment. And we believe that good spatial computing acknowledges reality, respects reality, and interfaces with it. For example, occlusion. If a magical sea turtle swims under a table, it should occlude. It should know that the table is there and should be obstructed by the table. It shouldn't just be like, a again, a dumb overlay over reality. And that, in a nutshell, is what we're about. That is spatial computing. That is the future that we believe in and we're trying to bring forth with your help. So if we want to talk about the hardware a little bit, um, I typically at this point present the physical hardware and I'm happy to do so. Um, I don't know if you can see me or if you're just uh, seeing my screen. Um, so on the off chance that you can't see me, I'll just be relating to the, to the actual pictures this time. But of course, you'll have plenty of access to the actual hardware later on. So going from left to right, uh, we have the light pack. The light pack is the actual computer that we call also the wearable that you wear pocket you clip it into your pocket or your belt or we actually have straps that you can put on and wear around you in any way that is comfortable to you um the board the soc is based on an nvidia tegra x2 or tx2 it's a fairly capable high-end mobile computer with an integrated gpu and cpu um it has an over operating system that we call Lumen, Lumen OS. Uh, it has Wi Fi and Bluetooth capabilities. Um, and the whole, the OS is a very close descendant slash close cousin of Android. So if you're familiar with Android development, a lot of the tools that we're about to talk about uh, will feel familiar. Um, and a lot of the conventions as well, like certificates. But by and large, that is the wearable. Um, and of course, the whole thing is untethered, just to set a baseline of what this thing is. So you just clip it, and that's the whole system. That's the computer. Um, what you wear is the lightware. Um, it has a light field display with waveguides, right? So you're basically, we're shooting photons into your eyes. Uh, there are no screens. So you'll never see pixels. You get that spatialized audio around your head with a set of speakers. You can also connect headphones. And in fact, we have a special pair of headphones called the, the Ambio AR1s made by Sennheiser. They're incredible headphones because they're made for AR. They don't block reality. So you know, if you're familiar with like noise canceling headphones, they do the exact opposite. They let reality in while augmenting it. Uh, but you get a great spatial audio experience out of the box just with the wearable. As you'll see, uh, Tanandi is a great experience uh, to really see the capabilities of our spatial audio. But really, most of our experiences will have great spatial audio uh, by one way or, or another. Um, and of course, aside from the light fields and the spatial audio, 
um, we have all the sensors. So uh, several depth cameras, an RGB camera, which is just a standard camera, as, as you might be familiar with from other platforms, um, some IR cameras, and uh, on the inside overlay behind the lenses, uh, four eye tracking cameras per eye that actually see what your pupil is doing, where it is, where you're looking. So it's a fairly capable uh, chipset um, with a lot of varying features. Uh, when we talk about the affordances and possibilities of the device, this is where all the detection is happening. This is where almost all of the all of the sensory information of the real world is actually being gathered. And finally, we have the control. The control is our controller. Um, it offers six degrees of freedom, so you get its individual position and rotation separately from the wearable. It is not reliant on um, a line of sight uh, or like you know marker detection, like other headsets that you might be familiar with. So in fact, you can still wave it behind your head uh, and get full tracking capabilities. Um, and it's it's very very powerful. Aside from that, it has two buttons: the bumper and the control, and the uh, sorry, the home button, which I'll demonstrate. Uh, you know, once I see you in person, it has a trigger which has sensitivity levels, so you don't just get the binary on off, but actually all the sensitivity levels of the trigger, and you can use them. Uh, and it also has a pressure sensitive touchpad that you can use uh, for X Y Z detection. Basically, in terms of feedback, you get both LED feedback, like a light. Um, ring around the control, around the, the touchpad, uh, as well as haptic feedback, um, both of which are fully programmable through the APIs, so you can absolutely access them and treat them as, a, as an uh, output or feedback mechanism in your experience. Okay, the magic leap one. Uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and ask, Ben, can, can you see my video feed? Or anyone else? Like, can you see my face right now? Or is it just the screen? Okay, perfect, thank you. So you can see my face, that's great. So I will be taking it out after all, because this is a point well worth making. Uh, if you've ever seen me do any kind of these decks before, um, I suspect one or two of you may have, you already know that we are sticklers for this point because it makes a big difference in your experience. So I have a Magic Leap 1 here. This is the wearable or the light pack. This is, um, this is what I'm going to clip on my pocket. And this is the light wear and the point that this slide is making is very simple, but it makes a night and day difference in your experience. So if you put it on, um, what everybody's going to want to try and do is put it on flush, just like any other headset. So if you see my side here, uh, it's, I'm sort of wearing it in parallel. And that guarantees discomfort and guarantees a poor FOV experience. And really, if you adjust it, you go from the crown of your head down like this. Okay, so you have this actual, yeah, I want to make sure you can see me. So it's not touching my ears and it's actually coming down at a tilt you will see two things once one it's instantly way more um comfortable and two uh you get a much much better visual experience out of it so we will be reminding this again uh to everyone uh during the actual hackathon it will make a tremendous experience in in, in a tremendous difference in the quality of your experience so just something to keep in mind uh, another thing we'll have available at the hackathon is the Magic Leap Hub. Unfortunately, ah, I do have one here. Um, the hub is a little piece of plastic. It's really nothing that fancy, but it again makes a huge difference in your development experience. So what it lets you do is actually connect the charger and the computer at the same time, which means you will never run out of battery as you're hacking. Now, if you've ever been to a hackathon, you know we're talking about like 12 hour days, eight hour days. Uh, typically the hardware stays plugged in throughout. You're building and iterating and iterating and iterating. You don't want to be doing this without being connected to power all the time. Um, you can, it's not terrible. It's just eventually you'll run out of juice and then you'll have to stop working in order to plug it in to charge it. And that doesn't make sense. So we'll have hubs, make sure you grab one. Um, they're incredibly, incredibly useful. All right, eye calibration. Another really important thing to know about. Um, the Magic Leap 1 is suited to work with your individual eyes and sort of like no one else's. So um, when you buy one when you, when, or when you get one and it's yours, the first thing that happens out of the box when you take it out of the box and you, and you start fitting it, uh, aside from a very basic fitting experience, is the device calibrates itself your eyes. And that serves two purposes. 
fun. Um, it provides better visual fidelity and the depth planes basically play better to your eyes with the visual experience because now they're calibrated to exactly where your eyes are. And the other thing is that eye tracking is that much more accurate, again, because once you do the eye calibration process, the device has an idea about your eyes, uh, your prescription if you have any, sort of where you're looking and so forth. Now, eye calibration happens, as I said, when you take the device out of the box and turn it on for the first time. You can also redo it uh, any number of times because it's a standalone app that's available to you in the settings. So um, I can't recommend this enough. As you start developing, as you just check out your device, go to your table, take it out of the box, have the main developer who will be working on the experience uh, or one of two or one of three or whoever many do eye calibration. Now it's important to mention that, you know, oftentimes we do demos for hundreds of people uh, or we have partners who do the same and, you know, they can't possibly calibrate before every single experience. It takes uh, several minutes and you don't want to start folks demos by like running them through a two and a half minute eye calibration experience. So it's not an absolute must have and the device is getting better and better and better at adapting in real time to your eyes regardless of calibration data. That said, especially if you're going to be relying on eye tracking, uh, plan to do uh, eye calibration because it will improve the accuracy of the results that much more. Great. And then the final point, um, and if you take anything away from, from this presentation, aside from the few technical things that are going to be useful for you to ramp up, on, ramp up on before the hackathon, is go forth and explore. Um, we know you're here to create. We love that you're here to create. You know, we're all about our creators. But you will want to spend 30 minutes, an hour at any point, just checking out the existing experiences, trying out things like Tonandi or Create or Dr. G's Invaders or even Angry Birds or any number of applications that have already come out for the device, many of which we spent years making. Um, and the reason you want to check these out is not just as consumers uh, of, of entertainment or of whatever app that is, but also to do some clever intelligence gathering and see like, you know, how did they do meshing? Um, how are they reacting to the environment? Which input mechanisms are, are they using? Are they relying heavily on the control? Because one of the things you'll discover with the device is that you have 15 ways to do anything. And the real question isn't how do I do something, but what's the best way to do something? What is the best interaction to use when I have an idea? Um, and many of these best known practices, you know, nobody has the rule book yet. It's all way too new. But um, many folks, both internally and externally to Magic Leap, have discovered things that really work. Uh, so I can't recommend this enough. Uh, when you plug it in, before you start jumping into Unity or Unreal and writing code, try it out for a bit. Play something. Play Create, play Tanandi, play Dr. G, play Angry Birds. Um, I know I just said the same four. They're really excellent apps. We have about 23 apps right now in the store, uh, something like that. Uh, try at least some of them. Most of them are free um, and highly recommended. Uh, consider it an XR Magic Leap education before you start. So having said that, I'm about to go into the ecosystem, dev tools, and resources. Before that, I would like to see um, how we're doing. Oh my, um, how we're doing on questions. Uh, I would like to do that without. Oh, I know why this is happening. It's because I'm in full screen, isn't it? Chat. Perfect. How long does the calibration take? It takes about two, two and a half minutes. You have to sit, sit still when you do it. You can't talk or laugh. I found that hard. The hard found that out the hard way. Uh, if you do, it's not going to be precise enough. But once you're sitting still and just looking at these targets, it takes about two minutes. Uh, I've been recording this, by the way. Fantastic. How long does calibration take? Uh, da -da -da -da. Ready to blaze this hackathon. Fantastic. Is there a link to the developer documentation for this smart glass? There absolutely is, and we are about to talk about it. Um, am I going to share a link to the deck? I can't do that. I will see if I can get a version of the deck that I can share a link to uh, by the time the hackathon start, starts. I'll be working with Ben, so he'll be able to let you know the latest. How many Magic Leaps will there be? Might as well mention it now. I think we're looking at uh, 10 headsets right now. Uh, ben, correct me if I'm wrong. It's I've, I'm, I'm in London mode, so I'm a little foggy on the details, but it's between 10 and 15 headsets. Um, and we will do our best to, to accommodate everyone who's interested in using a headset. Um, I believe those are all the questions for until now. This is good. Um, 
uh, we're doing um, we're doing well on time. Will you offer an intro session on the day of the hackathon? That is a great question. I would love to, if possible, but the schedule is not in my control. Ben, do you have any thoughts on that? Okay, so I'm not sure. Um, Ben might be um, Ben might be unavailable right now. Uh, we will look into this. The idea is absolutely to do it. So uh, if nothing else, we'll make this video available. So anybody who wants to see this again will be able to. Um, and um, and uh, we will do everything we can to make all the information super accessible to you. So just so you know, the way this is going to work. Uh, not just going to be talking about things, I'm going to be leaving you with specific breadcrumbs, if you will, or specific leads to the learning resources. So you can absolutely get a huge head start right now. Uh, there's a lot of software to download. There's a lot of things you can learn before the hackathon. We want to make sure that anybody who's interested in learning before the hackathon knows where to go. Do you have rigged asset models that we can use like people? Uh, we do not manufacture 3D models. Uh, we, you know, we're a hardware and software spatial computing company. Um, I'm happy to chat in person if you want to talk about it about places where you could might find them uh, just as a developer myself uh, but no we do not we do not offer models you know we're all about the the, the headset uh, the wearable and sort of like the spatial computing world that can be created around it uh, I feel the Google sheet sheet for me magically point requisition fantastic okay uh, I'm gonna dive back into the deck and then I'm going to check back for questions I promise we will have more time for Q&A anybody who has a question just um, Type your questions there, and uh, we will absolutely get to them. I hear, I see sample codes will will help. I completely agree; they will, and I will show you where to find them. So, uh, going back to the deck. Let's chat a real quick about the software ecosystem. Usually at this part in the deck, I like to ask folks what they're working in. Um, we are having a bit more of an asynchronous situation, so it's a little it's proving a little more challenging. I'm going to go ahead and assume most of the folks are in Unity because that's bar not been the, res the result to that question in every time I've asked that question before. Um, but I, I will absolutely make sure to, to, to talk about the entire ecosystem and the alternative pathways. But uh, yeah, to start with, absolutely. We have Unity SDKs and we have Unreal and Engine for SDKs. So if you're working with one of the two biggest engines in the industry, you're in good hands uh, and on onboarding should be quick and painful painless for you. Um, I want to mention two specific things about Unity and about Unreal Engine 4 because these things are constantly in flux. Things have happened recently, uh, so I want you to have the latest and greatest information. Um, also, all of this information is available in our creator portal that I'll be talking about in a little bit. But if you're a Unity developer, you should know that you will want to use our most recent SDK with Unity 2019 beta. Um, you will have links to all of this. I will show you where to find them. But if you're already curious, like which version of Unity do I use? Is there a specific build? Is there something? So there used to be a specific build for Magic Leap. That is no longer the case. So right now, if you have the latest Unity 2019, you should be all set to work with the Magic Leap one. Uh, make sure that your SDK is the latest, which is 0 0.20. And also you'll want to make sure that your OS system is the latest. Uh, we're not going to go into this right now, but uh, there will be humans at this hackathon. There will be leapers. I will be there. My evangelist partner in crime will be there. So when you get the device, devices, you're not left stranded. We will make sure that each and every one of you is able to develop and do exactly what they want to do. So just at a high level overview, know that um, you will want the latest and greatest of Unity with Unreal Engine 4. Again, if you just download the latest binary, which is 4.22, you're good to go with Lumen development. You will want to make sure you select both Lumen and Android as development targets when you select the optional development targets in the engine. Once you do that, you're good to go. Um, you'll want to work with either SDK.20, which is the latest, or 0.19, which is the second to latest. Either one will work. Um, but by and large, you like Unity, you can work with Unity. You like Unreal, you can work with Unreal. Are you a web developer? In that case, uh, we have some offerings for you, plus more exciting things in the future. So we currently have a framework called Prismatic, which is essentially a model loader in HTML. So if you're familiar with a frame, for example, it looks very similar in that you write HTML tags and you immediately can load models, animate them, and have a limited amount of interaction with them. That said, real talk, it's not super 
powerful, I wouldn't build an app with it. Um, I would tinker with it to see sort of like the capabilities. Beyond that, um, very soon, not for the hackathon, but very soon we will have WebXR capabilities. So if you are living in that really exciting nook of WebXR or WebGL or WebVR, and you love libraries like 3JS or A-Frame, uh, or you like writing raw WebGL, in which case more power to you, all of this will be available to do on device, which is incredibly exciting, uh, just not quite yet, unfortunately. So for this hackathon, um, by and large, I would plan on working on either in Unity or Unreal Engine, or our own engine, Lumen Runtime. Now, if you're a JavaScript developer, another piece of good news is that Lumen Runtime lets you work in JavaScript uh, and lets you create landscape apps. And we're about to gently skip over the rest of this slide and talk about what landscape apps are. So in the Magic Leap 1, you can create one of two types of experience, experiences, uh, either an immersive application which basically means an application that takes over your entire environment. So when you're running it, like Dr. Gordboard's Invaders in this image, um, you are immersed by this application. You don't have other little pieces of software all around you, right? Because if you're shooting robots that are coming out of your walls, you'll want to focus on them. If you're interacting with sound spirits and beautiful shader magic and spatial audio and it's very artistic and emotional experience, you don't want a browser reminding you that, you know, what time it is or what Google is saying. So that's an immersive application and you can develop that using Unity or Unreal Engine or Lumen Runtime. Alternatively, we also have landscape applications. Landscape applications are best thought of as widgets or multiple windows that live side by side, except of course they're not windows, they're not 2D, they're actually in your environment. But the idea with landscape applications is that uh, these are applications that live in bounded vo volumes called prisms all around your space. And the nice thing about them is that they are persistent. So for example, if you open up an instance of uh, YouTube, or Google, or a gallery, you know, or uh, our social application, Avatar Chat, um, and you just place it at your bedroom wall. It's gonna stay there. Two days later, when you uh, open the, when you uh, turn the device back on, it's gonna be. So they're kind of, you can think of them as pieces of furniture in a way. They persist in the space you leave them on. They're really cool. They also have this capability in immersive applications. But the idea with landscape applications is that they co-inhabit your space. They're just there. Um, that application pathway is available currently only through Lumen Runtime, our own engine, which you can use uh, JavaScript to write in. So just to recap, if you want to make immersive applications, you can use Unity, Unreal Engine, or Lumen Runtime. If you want to make landscape applications, currently you can only use Lumen Runtime. Now, Back to your questions and, you know, something I saw at least two things asking about, code examples, tutorials, all of these things, where do I find them? Well, the good news is we have what we call a creator portal. Uh, it's not what we call it, it's, it's exactly that. Um, you can find it by going to creator.magicleap.com. You will need to sign up as a creator, and this is important. You'll have to sign up as a creator with an email uh, to access all of the resources. So the software tools, the certificates to, to the device, and all of the learning resources, including our API docs. Um, super approachable. They're right there. You just have to sign up, so just know that. Um, once you reach the creator portal, you see that it has three main sections, and we're going to go over each and every one of them because they're all super important. So. The learn section is what you think it is. It is where you learn all about the device. And we have a ton of learning resources. So it's not that we have a single tutorial or just like here are the API docs or all of that. Uh, we have a slew, a, a really a tome of learning resources that fits all knowledge levels. Um, and whether it's your first steps with the device or you already work with the device a little bit, you want to learn more, or whether you want to dig into a particular feature, all of this is available in the creator portal. Um, so as you can see, just as you start, you have resources like the Magic Leap 1 Quick Start, um, general operation tips that are really, really important uh, in, in really learning how to work with the device before you even make content for it, like how to, once you put it on, what are the best practices and so forth. Um, beyond that, we have a whole design section that sort of addresses the new considerations of spatial computing. Uh, um, that have not really been a focal point before uh, for design 
characters, whether it's 2D or even in VR. So one thing you'll discover very, very quickly is that when you're designing for the real world, for volumetric data in the real world, many of the rules of the game are, you can just throw them out because we have to find new ones. Many things be behave completely differently and you have to start taking into account um, UX considerations that you've never had to think about before. Um, for example, think about the fact that when you work on any Magic Leap experience, by default, you're designing for a room that you don't know, that can be of any size, any proportions. It can be as cluttered as my hotel room here. Uh, it can be as sparse as a location-based experience. Um, there are a lot of factors that have to be thought of, not only from the code and API perspective, but also from the design considerations. And that, that part of the creator portal is really, really helpful in helping you start thinking about these things. Beyond that, um, our, our develop section is sort of um, where you want to go for questions that are specific to engines, specific to features, specific to capabilities of the device. Um, you'll see that there's a Unity section, there's an Unreal section, there's a C API section. It if you happen to have your own engine and you want to connect to the device at the C level and really bind the device's capabilities to your own graphics engine, you can absolutely do that. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, Lumen Runtime, our own engine also is available there if you want to know more information about it, uh, as well as Magic Script, which is basically the, the ability to write JavaScript through Lumen Runtime, compile JavaScript, kind of like an, an Electron app, if that's something you're familiar with. So kind of like Slack in a way, uh, but of course, in a volumetric way, you basically JavaScript and then you don't make a web page, you make an app. That's what Magic Script is all about. Uh, of course, it's a, it's a spatial app. Um, this also includes all of the developer tools that I will be talking about. So just to set your mind at ease, I'll be talking about a lot of things in this presentation and everything is included in the creator portal. There's a lot of information and you can find all of it there. Um, aside from these learning resources uh, that also include, I just want to show you under core Lumen features, you can find um, um, feature specific information about the code. So for example, I want to know how to use hand poses in Unity. I click on that and I immediately see a thorough tutorial that walks me through everything from project setup all the way to actual very simple and straightforward but powerful code examples. So you can see that um, here I'm looking, for example, for specific gestures like open handbag or fist or finger. And a little before that, I'm setting up which gestures I want. Uh, and at the end of it, I have the full code example that shows me the typical script of how to use hand gestures. Um, this as a way of, of assimilating knowledge, it really cuts right to the chase, uh, and especially in a hackathon context, super useful. Uh, beyond that, we also have a tutorial section that is a little more beginner friendly. It's the absolutely best place to start, even if you're a seasoned developer. Um, make sure you're going to tutorial that's relevant to your platform. So for example, here we have a Lumen Runtime edition, here we have a Unity edition. We'll so of course have Unreal editions, um, and we have getting started guides for some of our simulation tools in Magic Leap Remote, which I'm about to talk about. The big takeaway, the creator portal is where you go to learn. The creator portal is also where you go to download all the tools. Uh, so really the main thing you wanna download from the creator portal is the package manager. The package manager is sort of a one place for all piece of software um, where you can download the Lumen SDK, which you're going to need the software development kit, regardless of what platform you're on, you're going to need the SDK. Uh, it also includes some of the simulation tools that we're about to talk about. And if I scroll down, you'll see that aside from some profiling tools and stuff like that, which talk to me in person, if you're interested, I'll tell you all about them. It also has the Unity section and the Unreal section, which contains both the links to the engine versions that you want to download. So if I click on Unity Editor and I click Open in, in Browser, it takes me immediately to the page that I want for the right version of Unity just to make sure that you know we all get it right. Uh, same for Unreal Engine. Um, now, Unreal Engine is a little trickier because it will take me to the GitHub repo if I click from here because you can actually build Unreal from source using our branch to, to access the latest and greatest SDK features. But if you just want to work with Unreal, uh, download the latest binary. It'll give you access to 95% of maybe even 98% of everything the device can do. It'll be a lot more stable. So if you're in Unreal dev, again, just go to the Epic Launcher, download 4.22, download the Lumen build targets, the Android build targets, and you can get to work. Aside from the actual engine links, which you'll notice are not hosted on our page, they send you to 
the partners page, like to Unity or to Epic, uh, you also find the Unity package and the Unreal package, the Unreal examples. Now, the Magic Leap Unity package is something you absolutely want. It is not optional. A lot of the SDK features actually live there. So you will want to download it and start your workflow by creating a new project and immediately importing the package. The package includes some of the meshing prefabs, some of the camera prefabs, a lot of the stuff you'll want to have right out of the box instead of troubleshooting. So if you're working in Unity, as I imagine most of you will be, download the Magic Leap Unity package as well as Unity. So just to recap, let's go for the obvious case scenario. You're a Unity dev, you've got your device, you just checked out, you want to get started. Hopefully you've already done this step because a lot of this takes time to download, but the things you need are the Lumen SDK, the Unity package, uh, and of course the Unity editor. Same for Unreal. Uh, you also have Lumen runtime resources here. Um, if you want Magic Script, you actually have a Magic Script link here. So if you want to dig, I recommend go ahead and dig into the package manager, download the things you want, work with the latest SDK. This is really important. You actually can access previous versions of the SDK only going back to point 11, which we released in like last August. Um, you definitely want to work with the latest SDK, Lumen SDK 0 0.20, easy to remember, 2.0. So that's a little bit about the package manager. I'm not going to check questions yet. I bet there are some. I'm going to check them in a little bit. I'm going to make sure I leave at least 10 minutes for questions. Um, the last thing about the creator portal that I want to show you is that is where certificates live. Now, if you've ever developed for either Android or an Android-based platform like the Oculus Rift, or the Oculus Go, you already know about certificates. Uh, the idea is that for safety and mostly for security reasons, you have to issue a certificate for anything you deploy on device. So not necessarily if you're running things in Unity in play mode using the simulation, but if you actually want to test your application on device, and of course, eventually build it, you're going to need a certificate. Uh, they're very straightforward to issue. You can find information about them in the creator portal. So just search for certificates and you'll find it. But basically, they're under the publish section in the certificate section. Um, I'm going to change this from Magic Leap Internal to my individual publisher page. You will not see Magic Leap Internal, of course. Um, and you're able to add new certificates. I will not walk you through the process right now. It's about four minutes to learn. It's very straightforward, although there are a couple of gotchas, like you, you'll see, uh, and we'll absolutely work with you. For now, just work that they know that they exist and that when you build to device, you're gonna wanna use certificates. Uh, and that by and large is that. There's lots more to talk about the creator portal, but those are the most useful resources. Now, furthermore, we made you a cheat sheet for hackathons. So if you go to this link, magi.ca slash hackathon, you will actually find the best uh, resources and the most useful resources for you in a hackathon context that get you up and running really quickly because we recognize that the creator portal is a huge body of knowledge, and oftentimes it can feel a little overwhelming, magi.ca slash hackathon is a good place to get started. That said, if you go to any one of the tutorials, it will walk you by the hand. It will. It does a really good job of hand-holding and make sure you have the right versions of uh, Unity, the right versions of Unreal, the right versions of the SDK. Make sure that you're set up, setting up your project correctly. So um, the best way to get started is either to take a look Look at this cheat sheet or just work your way through any one of the tutorials. Uh, either one will get you up and running in no time. Package Manager, we just discussed. Magic Leap Remote is really two tools and they're both incredibly powerful and I want to show them to you right now. So Magic Leap Remote is really our simulation suite and what it lets you do uh, is two things and they're a little confusing at first so I want to make sure that you understand how they're similar and how they're different. Basically, both give you uh, a way of simulating your experience as you're in Unity or in Unreal without having to build to the device every time. That's why they are really crucial. And I can't stress this enough. You do not want to be building to the device every iteration. That will drive you crazy, and especially in a hackathon, take way too long. Because every time you build to the device, it takes, what, four minutes. So imagine, like, building a cube, and wanting to see it on device, spending four minutes seeing it on device, going back, changing the cube color, building it again, going to the device, and like, oh great, the cube is green, now I want a blue sphere, adding a sphere, building it again. It's terrible. It's really frustrating, it takes forever, it's not productive. What you want to do is make friends with the remote. The tool is available to you under the SDK tab. 
So if you look here, you see um, once you download the SDK, you actually have access to use ML Remote, and you can just click here and get to this tool. It works for both Mac and PC, uh, as does our SDK, of course. And the idea here is that, again, there are two tools. There is a simulator, which gives you access to 80% of the device's features. And the good news is that you don't even need a device to run it. You can all, once we stop chatting, you know, once this presentation is over, you can go download it right now and get working with it right now with Unity. Uh, and the idea is that you have access to eye tracking, to the controller, to hands, like hand recognition and gesture recognition, and to head pose. And if you see what it looks like, it basically looks like this cool 3D world that I'm in, that I can navigate in using WASD and the mouse. And the nice thing about it is that these virtual rooms, even though they look very basic, can actually be meshed by the device. So if you want to get a taste for what it's like to actually uh, sample the real world 3D geometry and reconstruct it on device, you can run, for example, a meshing example in Unity and magically remote and mesh this virtual room. And it's just going to work as if this were a real space. Um, beyond that, we have several other virtual, virtual rooms. And the nice thing about this is that aside from also moving the furniture, if you want, like this, you can actually create virtual rooms completely from scratch. Uh, so you can simulate any environment that you want. And again, you do not need a device that is connected to this at all. It's really, really powerful. You can sit in a coffee shop, have uh, the simulator open, work in the Unity, and do development. And often, honestly, I, I have two devices, one personal, one from work. When I sit in a coffee shop and I develop, I use the simulator because it's that much more useful than taking out the device and looking really weird in front of people and all of that. <laughs> Although sometimes that can be fun too, and people always ask like, "Ooh, what is this?" So it's a different kettle of cats. But long story short, the simulator exists. Uh, it's really, really powerful and highly recommended. Aside from the simulator, we also have a tool called uh, Zero Iteration, and what it lets you do. I'm not going to run it right now because I don't have a device connected. But what it basically lets you do is, if you have a device that is connected and you have Magic Leap Remote open and you have Unity open, you can just start device, uh, which is not going to work now because it's going to say I'm not seeing a device that's connected, hit play in Unity or in Unreal, put the device on, and immediately be in your experience just by being in Unity in play mode, which is super powerful. Again, you can access eye tracking. You can access hand gestures. You can access key, point, key points in your fingers. Uh, you can access um, meshing and play plane recognition and ray casting and almost all of the features that are available to you on the Magic Leap 1 are available to you at real time, at runtime by hitting play in Unity or in Unreal. That is how you want to be developing. Again, do not build to device every time again and again and again. It'll drive you crazy and it'll be a huge waste of time, all the more so in a hackathon context. What you want to do is make sure you understand how Magic Leap Remote works, which is something you can do right now before the hackathon, um, and understand how, how to work with it and your engine of choice. And that'll get you up and running that much faster, that'll let you iterate that much faster, and it'll be just a more fun experience, to be honest. So those are just a few words about Magic Remote. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions about it. Um, I know we, we, Ben mentioned we can run a little over time if we, if we, can, if we have to. Uh, we're not going to do a ton of time, but I, I will absolutely make sure that all the questions that are asked will be answered. Onwards, another really, really cool and useful tool is the Magic Leap Device Bridge, uh, MLDB. It is a CLI or a command line interface, meaning you run it in your terminal or you know in PowerShell if you're on a PC. Um, and basically, it is a terminal, a command line way to connect to the device. So um, it's really useful for sanity tests. For example, if you run the command MLDB devices, you can immediately see how many devices are connected to their computer to your computer and how. Um, if you run the command MLDB Wi-Fi, you can see the Wi-Fi status and connect to Wi-Fi. If you want to start logging your application that you already built, so the same logs that you would see in Unity or in Unreal, uh, you can type MLDB log. And if your application is running and connected, that's where the uh, your output logs that you're printing out are going to print to. They're going to print to your computer. Um, MLDB push and pull to get media and data from the device. For example, if you're cap capturing things or, um, or if you're, uh, you're saving images and stuff like that, um, or you're recording video, that's one way to grab it. Uh, so MLDB is incredibly useful. If you need to do something with a device, chances are you can do it with MLDB as well as other ways. But just know that it exists. Uh, 
MLDB also is available to you from the same page, the Lumen SDK. You'll see that I have uh, use ML Remote and I have Open Shell. If I click Open Shell, it'll open up a terminal window. Sorry about all these error messages. If I type MLDB, you can already see it gives me all of the commands that I might ever need. Um, another thing worth mentioning, uh, you don't need to have the device physically connected for it. You can actually forward a um, sorry, forward a port over Wi-Fi to your computer, meaning you can connect to the device over Wi-Fi, meaning you can also uh, use ML remote over Wi-Fi and iterate over Wi-Fi. So imagine that you can actually hit play in Unity, get up from your desk, start walking around and meshing the room, and it totally works. Uh, it's pretty awesome. It means you're not tethered at any point. It's a sweet development experience. Um, we don't have time to get into it right now. It's very straightforward to set up. You can either look it up in the creator portal or let's chat once we're at the hackathon. I'll show you how to get up and running. We discussed uh, captures, capture and device stream. So just at a very high level overview, as I mentioned, we really encourage you to share your work. It's really cool. Uh, also, it's definitely something you'll want to do for your own purpose. Um, there are two main ways to share your work. You can either capture um, while being in the experience using the controller or using MLDB, and you can capture images or video with or without the ambient audio. So if you want just your experience audio, you can do that. If you want to experience to capture the room audio, you can also do that. Um, and that's one way, but that's just like a recording. As opposed to that, the really cool thing that we just rolled out is device stream. So if you have the Magic Leap mobile app, which also I recommend downloading, uh, you can actually stream to the device in real time and thus overcome the problem of, you know, if somebody's in the device, nobody else can see what they're doing, right? That's always the case with VR. That's all, sometimes you can stream to the computer. Uh, that's certainly the case with AR. Um, that's how you overcome it. So you can stream to the mobile companion app and from it to anywhere else. I just saw this morning a colleague was streaming to a, a 4K TV. It looked beautiful in real time. And then when you're experiencing an application, you can actually see what the user is doing in real time, help guide them, help troubleshoot. If you have more than one dev, both of you can see what's happening at the same time. Incredibly useful. Don't worry about how to do it right now. The important thing, keep in mind, you can do it. That's the main takeaway. Keep it in mind as a possibility for the hackathon. Finally, uh, this is the last slide. I just want to go over the device, the perception stack features that are available to you. We mentioned some of them so that we all have a baseline of what you can do with this device. And then we're going to open up the floor for questions. So right off the bat, you get head pose or really two head poses because you get the head pose of the device you get the pose of the controller. Both of them offer six stops, six degrees of freedom. What this means is that you get three degrees of freedom, pitch, you and roll, and you get three degrees of position, so X, Y, and Z, right? So the idea is that both of these pieces, you know their position and rotation at any given point in your app lifecycle. They are not tethered, don't use lighthouses, uh, and they're not limited by scale. You can get up and walk, and I guarantee there is a hard limit eventually, but the hard limit is currently capped, I think, at 80 square meters. So believe me, uh, you have more than enough room for whatever app you have in mind. Uh, if you feel that may not be the case, let's absolutely discuss it. But uh, it's a very powerful thing. We like to call it world scale because that's essentially the scale of the experience. You can essentially um, not be limited to any particular part of a room or something like that. Uh, beyond that, you have two things you can do with your hands. You have gestures like C shape, index finger, L, uh, you know, fist, you can trigger experiences using these gestures. And you also have access to the raw key points, as I mentioned. So you know where your index finger is, you know where your middle finger is, you know where your thumb is, and you know where each knuckle is. Uh, soon we will be opening up the entire hand of both hands, of course. Uh, but right now you have these three fingers in both hands, um, as well as the wrist center. Um, as well as the palm center. So you really have a lot of data and a lot of power. And that's how, if you want to interact with uh, mixed reality content, that's oftentimes a really compelling way to do it. You just put colliders on these data points. They're updated in real time, and then you can actually start touching 
spatial computing content. We have image tracking. So if you've ever worked with Vuforia or any other similar stack, you're already familiar with it. Basically, what image tracking is, if you see an image with a lot of features in the real world, like you know the cover of my laptop screen, which has a ton of features because it has a lot of uh, stickers in a very messy way. Uh, and as long as the features are distinct, uh, the device can recognize the image uh, and immediately cause some action, make some mesh appear, do anything you want just by virtue of recognizing that image, knowing where it is in real space and reacting to it. So that's a feature that's available to you. Eye tracking. So separately from head pose, as I mentioned, you also have the ability to know where your eyes are looking at any given point. Uh, Data-wise, you get that as a fixation point, which is a vector three. So at any given point, I could be looking anywhere, and the vector three is literally what my eyes are doing. Right now, I'm looking at the screen. So the vector three will be here and you're able to visualize it. Just put a sphere on it and immediately see where your eyes are looking. It's really powerful, really compelling, really useful as a secondary input mechanism. Uh, highly worth experimenting with and considering when you're thinking about your application for this hackathon. Audio. Um, audio, I always say, deserves its own talk because it's incredibly important and incredibly powerful on the device, and there's a lot you can do. But at a very high level overview, um, in terms of output, as I mentioned, you have spatial audio all around you, so you can count on spatial audio. Beyond that, we also have something we call the Magic Spatial Audio, MSA plugin, which works with Unity and with Unreal, uh, and gives you a much higher fidelity of audio that really behaves the way it reacts in the real world. So it respects the room. That and it simulates the room that it's in. It simulates what it's like to hear audio really close with something called HRTF, head-related transfer frequencies, or sorry, transfer functions, which are basically uh, what sound does when it's really close to you and it's not just like in the air. So if you want to take your audio to the next level, absolutely use the Magic Spatial Audio plugin. You can use it in Unity or in Unreal, uh, and it's available to you in the package manager. Uh, and in terms of inputs, you have an inter uh, a directional mic. So you get um, you know, your user's data, like words, speech, singing, anything at all. It's a good mic. Uh, a lot of folks ask about speech to text and text to speech. You can absolutely do it. We don't have a first party um, part, uh, solution to that in our SDK yet, but you can integrate things like Google Watson or any other number, I'm sorry, IBM Watson or Google's uh, natural language processing API. Uh, any one of those will work. We've seen it work before. It's a very popular use case for hackathons for some reason, so many of you will probably be doing it. Uh, so just know that's available to you, and in terms of the microphone, you can treat it just like almost any other microphone you'll be working with in Unity or in Unreal. Uh, and finally, of course, we have world reconstruction, which is meshing. So um, you have various ways of finding out about the environment and knowing uh, what the environment looks like. You either can mesh the 3D geometry, meaning this pair of headphones, even though it's not flat or straight or anything, it will be meshed and, and the device will know exactly what it looks like. Um, you also have, and of course, surfaces will be meshed as well. You also have a planes API, which means, hey, don't tell me about all of the geometry in the room. Tell me just about walls and ceilings and floors. Just whenever there's a big plane, I want to know about it. And the nice thing about that API is that it gives you a semantic understanding of what that plane is. So for example, you can look for floors and know when the floors uh, are, are identified or just walls and so forth. Um, there's also a raycasting API, which lets you just shoot a point either from the device or from the controller to, but unlike raycasting in a game engine, which you might be familiar with, this is raycasting to the real world. So, you know, I have an object here. If I raycast here, it's just going to hit that object. It's going to recognize that there's something here in the real world. Uh, it can then, you know, set a collider here, for example. It also gets the normal of that object. So you can know which direction it's facing uh, and sort of like what its surface looks like. And it's very, very powerful. And one of the tricky bits is that you have all of these ways to get data from the real world, and it's up to you to decide which is the most sensible way to get that data. We are always happy to chat about it. Uh, and, and again, it will not be just me. Uh, there will be at least three of us, maybe more, um, that will be able to provide answers and work with you as you work your way through the code to find the best ways of going about things. And definitely avail yourselves of us when we're there. That's exactly what we're there for. And you know, I've been at Magic Leap for about two years now. My fellow uh, evangelists and dev techs and so forth will have been at Magic Leap at the very least many months. Um, and they're all very capable and they all know what they're doing. And they're all very hands-on with the code. So definitely take advantage of us, come chat with us, show us what you're working on, pick our brains. This is what we'll be there for. 
And with that said, let's answer some questions. So, um, if I can find this, here we go. All right, all right, perfect. Let's pick up from where we were before. Sample codes, codes will help. Hopefully you, you, you've seen where to find them now. Uh, does Magic Leap 1 work with Amazon Sumerian and React Native? Great question. Amazon Sumerian is super awesome. Uh, React Native is, so let me start from the end. React Native is completely irrelevant uh, because React Native, uh, as, as the person who asked the question uh, knows, um, is sort of a mobile, uh, is a way to use React, which is a, a, a web library to build mobile applications. Uh, it is not conducive to 3D experiences. We haven't even looked at it. Uh, it just feels like the wrong tool for the purpose. So it doesn't work with React Native. Uh, Sumerian is a much more interesting question. It does not right now. It's absolutely something we will be looking at once WebXR support really rolls out later this year. Uh, I think it's a huge value proposition. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for even asking. Like, now I get to mention that folks asked about it. Uh, unfortunately, not yet. What version of UE4 is supported? So we go all the way back to 4.19, I believe. Uh, but the, the real question there is which version of RSDK will that particular build of Unreal 4 support? And that's why I mentioned you want to grab the latest, really. You want to grab 4.22 because that's the one that supports our uh, latest or second to latest SDK, 0.19 and 0.20. Uh, if you go to 4.20 in Unreal, uh, it will only support, uh, I believe, uh, uh, SDK 0.16, which is far older. So I strongly recommend for this hackathon and for working with Magic Leap 1 in Unreal, doing one of two things, either downloading the latest binary from the Epic Launcher or going to Epic's GitHub repo and compiling specifically the Unreal Engine branch that is the Magic Leap branch uh, to really work with our latest and greatest. Uh, you can absolutely chat about both. Um, great. How is networking handled on device? Same as normal. Absolutely same as normal. You get Wi-Fi access uh, and you would implement networking uh, in applications, sort of like you would anywhere else if you're familiar with libraries like UNet or Photon, so forth. Works beautifully. There are some additional considerations, uh, like, for example, the device overrides the camera's head pose, so you're going to have to treat cameras a little differently, but by and large, you can count on normal networking, absolutely. Um, it's worth mentioning that later this year, we will be rolling out our own shared user API called MapMerge, uh, where basically you can start counting on both users seeing the same content, uh, but it's not there yet. So right now, you would have to implement it at the app level using either your own networking solution or some third-party solution. Can you combine the two? I'm sorry, this must have been asked in real time, and I do not. Oh, I see. Or is landscape encompassing or of immersive? So the farthest you can go there is you could actually launch one from the other. So you could launch apps just like in any OS uh, from a different app. That said, I do not recommend doing it. They're really two different animals. Um, and uh, also wiring them together can take a little while. So uh, please come and find us and let's chat about your particular use case for that. Um, Theoretically, you should absolutely be able to do that, uh, but it's not something we often see done, which is no reason not to do it, but you know, let's chat about it. MLDB devices. Uh, not sure that's a question. I'm going to go on. Um, how does the Magic Leap 1 utilize the capabilities of a 5G network? How does it connect to 5G? Uh, they won't be bringing 5G hardware, build apps that will benefit from 5G in the future. Yes, so to, so to clear, um, to, to set a baseline about 5G, we have uh, a partnership with AT&T. 5G is a huge part of it. Uh, the Magic Leap 1 is not the last device we'll be shipping and we'll have many more news uh, about the next iterations of the device. That said, the Magic Leap 1 is the first iteration. It does not have 5G capabilities. Uh, as Ben Nelson mentioned, it is to build apps that will benefit from 5G in the future. Uh, we're very, very excited about that future, uh, but just to be super clear, the Magic Leap 1 does not have uh, 5G capabilities yet, uh, or at all, sorry. The next iterations absolutely will have. Um, yeah, sorry, BioBlaze, you've checked multiple times with everyone. Um, I, I, uh, I appreciate your curiosity. It's definitely a very enticing value proposition. We too, believe me, can't wait for it to ship. Um, I'm using 420 for spatial OS. That's probably back to Unreal. Um, I would say for any particular questions, feel free to, to DM me on Twitter. I'm Michael Hazani at Twitter. I'm going to post it here, uh, and I can try to address your question. You can also take it to the forums. 
Um, I didn't mention it, but the forums are a great place to get your questions answered. Um, a lot of forums and a lot of these situations are handled either by interns or whatever. Rest assured that our forums are handled by pros, and whenever they get a question, that they don't have an answer for, they go back to the subject matter experts and get you authoritative answers at a very timely manner. So you want the official Magic Leap answer to something, the forums are a better resource than I am because I'll be able to tell you the latest I know, uh, but because things move very quickly, if you have a specifically a very technical question about is social open for development? Um, if you can clarify, do you mean the social suite? Um, I, I, I'm going to assume that you do. Yes, perfect. Uh, so I believe it is not open yet. I know exactly what you're talking about. There will be opening there. Uh, so we have a social suite, which is basically a really cool way to chat with your friends and have profiles and uh, have like avatars uh, embodied. If your friends are, of course, a country away, uh, and it's it's sort of like our take what does uh, spatial computing telepresence look like? Uh, now, as mentioned in Leap Conference a couple of months back, several months back, uh, we will be opening an SDK for developers, our networking infrastructure. Fortunately, it's not out yet. Uh, but I will mention this. Um, we've seen a lot of shared experiences at this point. Um, I recommend, for example, trying things like Spatiate on the Magic Leap one, which is essentially a really cool shared user AR tilt brush, if you will. So you can paint with your friends in the room or remotely. It's really, really cool. And it's entirely based on a shared experience. Uh, we've seen how it's done. We've seen how others do it. We know a lot about localization. We know a lot about how to get two devices to speak to each other in the same room. Find us for all of these questions. We'll be happy to chat about it. Is the app competition slash startup for 20 grand, 500 grand opening back up again? Yes. So. Uh, it absolutely will. In fact, the reason I'm in London right now is because we just did a boot camp for our European winners of that competition. It's called the Independent Creator Program. It's incredibly exciting, and it's basically, uh, as Safco mentioned, um, our way of funding and supporting the community and indie developers and their ideas uh, out of an acknowledgement that we don't know all the best solutions and the best things that need to happen and we want to get more voices in the room so what we did in december is we opened up a competition for anybody that wants to submit we received over 6500 submissions for ideas for things to build on the magic leap one platform uh we picked the winners and we're supporting them with funding with devices with mentorship and technical help and with account management management to help them through their uh, through their publishing process. So these teams are getting a lot of support from us. We just spent an amazing three days with them in Europe. A month ago, we had another one in Mountain View. They're really great. Come find me if you want to hear more about the program. I'm super excited about it. Uh, and the answer to your question is yes, it will be opening up back up again. Unfortunately, I can't commit to dates right now, uh, to be perfectly honest. I don't know them, but this is not like 2025. We're talking about soon. It is indeed awesome. Post a link, uh, certainly. Um, so the link, just to be very clear, uh, will take you to a blog post about the previous Indie Creator program where you can learn all about how it actually happened uh, and sort of like what we, uh, oh, come on. Sorry. Uh, independent Creator Program um, post. Here we go. Um, where you can learn about how that went down a little bit. Um, I am sending it to everyone. No, 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 no. Uh, here we go. So I just posted the link in the chat. Uh, if you can't see it for some reason, oh, I did send to just Ben Nelson. I terribly apologize. This is a confusing app. I'd like to have. Yep, you, you, you sure did. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Um, I wonder what else I sent just to Ben Nelson. But anyway, now everybody has the link. Thanks. Good catch. Um, so you'll be able to find more about the independent. I did send that Twitter link. So uh, that thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, yep. Thank you, Ben. Uh, just... <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't at my screen, so I didn't do that. Oh, no worries. Sorry, I missed. I wasn't sending this to everyone. Uh, um, and this is a good note to wrap up on. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. You're very welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I had a great time.
Uh, I hope this was of use for you. Feel free to hit me up with anything before the hackathon if I can help in any way or if you have any other questions. Uh, DMs would be the best way. Um, otherwise, if you have specific technical questions, I can already tell you I'll probably send you to the forum. If it's like, I need to implement OpenCV and I don't know how, you know, or like, uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, being a magic leap evangelist helps. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, happy to chat about anything. If you have any dev tools questions, if you have any learning resources questions, anything at all, I'm probably your best resource. If you have your own engine that you've implemented on your own spaceship machine uh, or whatever, and you want to know about the C API bindings, I'll probably be routing you to the forum, although you're welcome to hit me up anyway. How will we secure a magic leap for the hackathon? That's a great question. Uh, ben, uh, do you feel like maybe you could speak to that a little bit? Uh, yeah, one second. I will actually post the link. Um, we did email out a link um, that has a form to, to apply to get one in advance so that <laughs> it's at least reserved for you. Um, we'll Fantastic. also have some in addition that will be available on site so that there's some flexibility. Um, but I, I will post that link uh, in just a second. Uh, if not, you can also check your email. Um, you just want to make sure you fill that out so that we know we're, you know, providing the, the devices to people that we know are going to be the most successful with it um, and have projects that, that we think will uh, also be successful. Um, with that said, uh, uh, like I said, we, we will reserve some for those that, that are forming teams on site. Um, or that, you know, want to kind of recalibrate what they're working on to better fit um, what we're looking for. So I will post that in just a second um, and try to get it in today because I know Michael's going to try and review it and uh, email confirmation to some, pe some of the people today, um, but others will probably find out on the site. Absolutely. Um, okay. So there is the link to the Google form. Perfect. Um, yeah. And Nice. Nice. Well, I like that you're coming, you know, guns are blazing. Um, um, fingers crossed, we're going to get you a device. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you again, everyone. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, if you do have questions, again, feel free to DM me. Thank you for hosting, Ben. I'm going to try and make sure uh, to end the meeting properly and make sure we have a recording of this. So we can do a rerun. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're so very welcome. And uh, we'll see you at the hackathon. Feel free to DM me with any questions before that. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Uh, I'm also going to post a, a link to the, the Slack in case anyone missed it. Perfect. Yeah, and we will also be on the Slack as well. So that'll be another way for you to, to chat with us. All right. Awesome. Thank you, everybody, for Thanks joining everyone. us. And thank you, Michael, for a great presentation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.